We've been working very hard and successful with five sanction packages already. It's never been easy, but uh, maybe uh, there is positive outcome of this. I know that there's uh, a lot of work going on still. Council should now be able to finalize a ban on almost 90% of all Russian oil imports by the end of the year. First, there were sanctions that only hurt Russia, but now there are sanctions that also hurt European countries. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Tuesday, the 31st of May. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Embargo breakthrough. EU leaders agree to ban most Russian oil, paving the way for fresh sanctions on Putin. Brent jumps for the ninth straight day. Signs of daylight. China's economic contraction eases, signaling the worst of the lockdowns may be passed while mainline stocks climb. Plus, half-point hikes. The Fed governor, Chris Waller, says he favors consecutive 50 basis point rate increases until inflation comes down. Now, let's check on the markets, and then we'll wrap all of this together. It's increasingly clear that the market is on the rise sometimes, but not with great conviction, because we saw that earlier this morning. Futures were pointing to higher start, and then European stocks now down some half a percent. European technology down one percent. The concern is inflation. The concern is that with this extra sanctions package, of course, on Russia, oil creeping up. That means that inflation could, uh, you know, derail some of the growth plans if monetary policy tightens too quickly. Dollar, you can see 122.4 uh, and then Bitcoin 31,576. Now, if you look at the European map, again, quite a lot of pressure across the board. I would suggest U.S. Treasuries is where uh, there's quite a lot going on. Treasury yields actually jumping. I'm looking at the Bloomberg screen here on the iPad and we're seeing a, a sell-off in German bullion and European bonds that started yesterday, filtering through today, just the FTSE here in the UK gaining two tenths of eight percent. Now, European Union leaders have come together to back a ban halting the imports of most Russian oil. It paves the way for a sixth package of sanctions to punish Russia and President Vladimir Putin for the invasion of Ukraine. Now, we did hear from the Commission President Ursula von der Leyen on the measures. Council should now be able to finalize a ban on almost 90 percent of all Russian oil imports by the end of the year. This is an important step forward. Um, the remaining 10 percent on this one, we will soon return to the issue. Now, for more, we're joined by our Europe correspondent, Maria today. So, Maria, this significant agreement, I mean, technically, will it go through without a hitch? Uh, well, Francine, that remains to be seen. But politically yesterday, what was achieved here, and of course, we there's always a perennial criticism uh, that the European Union is very slow to react, that consensus is always very hard to achieve. But there is a deal nonetheless. And if you look at the technicalities, and again, they need to look into the fine print, and tomorrow more discussions are expected on the technical issues. But overall, if you take a 360 uh, picture of this, what you see is that the seaborne oil ban on Russian exports would put an end to two-thirds of the purchases that the European Union makes. And if Germany and Poland, which are big buyers of oil through pipeline, also follow through their promise to end it this year, by the end of the year, you could see a 90 percent reduction. So the impact is is, is big. And, and of course, we've talked a lot about Hungary and the impact that Viktor Orban had on this package. But ultimately, this is a political question. The Hungarian market is a small fraction of the market. So European officials believe that actually Actually, this will have a meaningful impact. And right now, Vladimir Putin is going to lose a big buyer, but also he has a problem. He needs to find new buyers who potentially will ask for a big discount. So, yes, today European officials believe that ultimately what was agreed here last night will actually be meaningful and perhaps take a big hit to the war chest of the Russian Federation on Ukraine. So, Maria, the other thing, of course, dominating discussions is food inflation. What can these leaders come together and do? 
Yeah, and this is a big concern, uh, Francine. It really is. Yesterday, uh, the Ukrainian president, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, he was on this call and he repeated and told European leaders again, you have to help me unblock the grain. Remember, according to the Ukrainian stats, they say that the Russians have essentially sequestered more than 22 billion uh, tons of grain and all of this is blocked and ports are right now are under Russian control and of course also on a technical and logistical perspective have been destroyed by the war so this will feature heavily there is a concern about the inflation pressure on this the economic impact but also Francine the social repercussions that this could have particularly on the poorer nations of the world so really this is I would argue perhaps equally as important as the sanctions for European leaders today. Yeah, we're talking about famine in certain countries, of course, in Northern Africa. Maria, thanks so much. Maria Tadeo there, our Europe correspondent in Brussels. Now, let's bring in Mike Bell. He's global market strategist at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Mike, always a delight to speak to you. So thank you so much for coming on. A lot of questions actually about conviction in the markets. There seems to be none even when they're going higher. What are the markets waiting for? I think it's very hard to have conviction at the moment. And I mean, broadly speaking, we think it makes sense to be neutral on stocks and pretty neutral on bonds, actually. Uh, because it's just so hard to know. And the news this morning, I think that just makes it even harder to have conviction because, of course, the big risk is that Russia could retaliate to these kind of measures, um, potentially by disrupting the gas flow to Europe. And that would have pretty grave economic consequences for Europe. So, Mike, if you believe that the outlook remains very uncertain, what does it mean for, I mean, if you're neutral, are you kind of in a wait-and-see situation? And what needs to happen for you to get, to get back in there forcefully? Well, as I, say, I think the biggest, I mean, as these sanctions get put in place, this is essentially ratcheting up the European economic response to the military uh, conflict that's going on in Ukraine. So now we wait and see what, what Russia does about it. Are they just going to accept this or are they going to retaliate? If you get retaliation, then I think, sadly, it becomes clear that the economic outlook is going to weaken quite significantly. Uh, so in some ways, the fact that these are being ratcheted up perhaps brings forward the point where we get some more clarity as to how Russia retaliates to this risk that has been on the table ever since the war kicked off. Uh, and when you talk about retaliation, this is a possible embargo on gas, or, are you, or is it militarily? Like, what's the limit? I know, we, you know, we can't predict a, a full escalation of war, but as a strategist, like, what are the, you know, pros and cons of, of what can we, you know, foresee, I guess? I still think that direct military conflict between Europe and Russia is a pretty low probability outcome. The risk in my mind is that Russia could retaliate by disrupting the gas flow. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's much, much harder for Europe to replace Russian gas than it is to replace the oil. Uh, and so that to me is the big risk out there which would make me be careful about being overweight risk assets at the moment. Mike, is there anything that looks attractive? The US, I guess, fairly contained because of the proximity to Russia because it's much further away. Yeah, and I think the, Rus the, the U.S. is less vulnerable to this shock because you've got um, much higher savings, we think, based on the data we've got. It looks like U.S. consumers are still sat on about double the savings they had pre-pandemic. Um, and, of course, their natural gas prices are not going up as much. So we do think they're less exposed to uh, the higher energy prices. However, the risk in the U.S. is 30-year mortgage rates have gone up a lot. Right? So you're starting to see that feed through into housing activity, at what level of mortgage rates does that start to slow the US economy? And we may not be that far from that point. So actually, when I look around the world and think, you know, where is there a lot of bad news priced in? To me, it seems like China is the place where there's the most bad news priced in. Yeah. And it just seems to me that the COVID zero policies that they've got can't go on for as yeah. long as some people think. It's just economically and probably politically unviable. And therefore, yeah. you know, if you look at where the most bad news is, it looks to me like it's in China. That's a really interesting call. So uh, let's talk about the Fed a little bit and then go back to China. Here's what the Fed governor, Christopher Waller, uh, had to say on the central bank's rate hike timeline. I support tightening policy by another 50 basis points for several meetings. In particular, I am not taking 50 basis points, 50 basis point hikes off the table until I see inflation coming down closer to our 2% target. We're back with Mike Bell. So, Mike, on the back of that, what will be the biggest pain threshold or pain point for markets as we get into quantitative tightening? I mean, I think it's all about the 30-year mortgage rate. 
Uh, most people in the US aren't even going to notice interest rates going up unless they move home. So it's all about what it does to housing activity, housing transactions, and that's all pinned on the 30-year mortgage rate. How much more can the Fed put rates up? It could be that actually the curve can flatten quite a lot. Short-end rates can go up. 30-year mortgage rates don't move that much. But if 30-year mortgage rates continue to move higher from here, then you're already seeing pending home sales roll over. You're seeing new and existing home sales come under some pressure. You know, that to me is the key thing that markets should be focused on in the US. Yeah. And, you know, when I look at it at the moment, it suggests to me that with Treasury yields where they are, they're a lot less unattractive than they were because it seems like they probably can't go that much higher before it would cause problems for the housing market. But Mike, are we underestimating then the impact that, you know, QT has on these markets? No one really knows, I think is the honest <laughs> answer. Right? It could well be that QT causes 30 rates to go higher. It's almost certainly been a factor in helping suppress yields. Um, as QT actually starts to play out, how much higher does it drive things? No one knows exactly how much higher and no one knows exactly what rate causes a problem. I would just focus on those home sales data because Mike, that's the key. You're making me nervous. Usually you're like so much more upbeat. What's going on? I think we just have to accept, right? We're in a period for the global economy where it's a lot more uncertain than it was a year or two ago, yeah. uh, where, you know, once the vaccines were announced, it was pretty clear we were coming from a beaten up economy to a world that was going to expand. The problem is things got better so quickly that we're now back with very tight labor markets and hence monetary policy tightening against an environment where house prices have gone up a lot. Yeah, a lot of people saying it's almost a perfect storm. Mike, thanks so much. Mike Bell, the global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management, stays with us. And I really want to get back to his China call. Coming up, China's factory activity still contracting, but at a slower pace as tough lockdowns begin to ease. We have more of that story next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, China's manufacturing activity shrank at a slower pace in May, suggesting the economic fallout from tough lockdowns may be coming to an end. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's chief Asia economics correspondent, Enda Curran. So, Enda, good morning again, or good afternoon. PMI is still contracting in May, but the pace was slower than last month. Could we say the worst is over right now for the economy? Some signs that the worst might be over, Francine, from this PMI reading. As you mentioned, the pace of the slowdown suggests some improvement. When you look at the data, for example, new orders, new export orders, all improving. There was a shortage in waiting time for deliveries for manufacturers. That's key to, to sort of ironing out some of these supply chain problems that they've been facing. And there was an uptick in employment uh, for manufacturers as well. And obviously, China has been flagging unemployment as a key concern in recent months as the lockdowns have impacted growth. So when you take it together, the PMI suggests both manufacturing and the services is heading in the right direction. But really, there's still a long way to go before you could call a full recovery. And nobody's calling a V-shaped rebound, having looked at these numbers either. So, Enda, where are we seeing the most improvement, if you can break it down for us? Well, I think the new orders and the new export orders index point to a kind of sense of relief on the production side of things as manufacturers can get going again as these lockdowns are eased. And obviously that's going to allow production uh, to get motoring now. The prospects for that appear to be improving by the day. Uh, Shanghai is heading towards a full reopening uh, slowly. Uh, Beijing looks like it has avoided a broader lockdown, certainly has avoided the kind of lockdown that uh, Shanghai has gone through. So all of that bodes well for the manufacturing sector, at least improving from here. Of course, the question marks, question marks will remain over how confidence, how much confidence will, will recover for both factories and consumers, given China continues to pursue the aggressive COVID zero strategy, which means that at any point there could be new restrictions or there could be new lockdown. And obviously people will be nervous and sentiment will be wary so long as the Omicron variant continues to spread. So some signs that the economy has hit a bottom, uh, some signs that perhaps the recovery could continue from here. But as I said earlier, no signs of a kind of a rapid V-shaped rebound that we saw back in 2020. Um, so, Enda, how long will it take to actually get back on track? And I don't, I'm not sure what we're talking about in back on track. I think Bloomberg Economics had growth in China at 2%. 
Well, most people are saying, look, the growth target of 5.5% is no longer really achievable for the government. They're frankly running, running out of time to meet that, Francine. It's more about putting a floor under the economy. Uh, you know, you can pick your level where that might be. But the authorities are taking measures. I mean, even before I come on today, there's some more news about another tax break for purchasing uh, lower emission cars. That's one of several steps that the authorities have taken in recent steps to boost home buying, to offer tax rebates to companies and to try and get more spending on projects going around the economy. As I say, we're not talking about sort of widespread stimulus per se that we've seen in past downturns, but we are seeing significant support. The question is, how effective can that be when the economy is going backwards and forwards, kind of in a stop-start fashion with the COVID zero restrictions going on and going off. And that's the big question. Yeah. How sustainable is both COVID zero and the economy's recovery in the months ahead? Thank you so much. Our end current there from Hong Kong. Now we're back with Mike Bell, global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management. Mike, you say basically, if you look at China, most of the bad news has been priced in. But then I look at a great Bloomberg story looking at China and Chinese banks overflowing with cash that nobody wants to borrow because their confidence is crushed. So, I mean, do we have further to fall in the Chinese economy or do you think we've, we've hit the worst? Ultimately, it comes down to what happens with COVID, right? They've been hit by just bad news after bad news. First, there was the property sector and the tech regulation and now COVID. And so, I mean, if you were owning stocks in China 12 months ago and they're now about 50% lower, I would suggest that now is probably not the time to be selling. Um, at these kind of levels, could they go a little bit lower? Perhaps they could. But if you say on a long-term view, you can buy an economy that's probably going to grow at something like 4% real GDP over the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, on a P of about 10, that seems pretty attractive yeah. to me as a medium to long term play. But so do you need to make a call on whether, you know, the COVID outbreaks will lead to further lockdowns or do you just look through it and take the longer term view? I think it depends on your time horizon, right? If you're a medium to long term investor, you just look through it. We know these lockdowns are not going to go on forever. So you can just buy these kind of valuations and ride the long term. Uh, if you care much more short term about the outcome, then of course that matters. Um, I mean, what I would say there is that it's ultimately down to vaccinations. The Chinese vaccine, if you get three doses of it, is very effective at preventing severe d disease yeah. against Omicron. So they just need to ramp up the vaccinations. So this, this market <laughs> Easier view, said than done. I mean, it is. But ultimately, there's a reason why a lot of people weren't getting vaccinated previously, because there wasn't COVID in China. Right. Now that Omicron is so contagious, and there is, and that's not going away, right? There's going to be mm -hmm. Omicron around... Um, for a very long time. So now the choice is, do you get vaccinated or not? And clearly, it's much more sensible to be getting vaccinated now. And in China, I think, you know, they're going to ramp up the incentives for people to get vaccinated. You know, if it's a case of once you've been triple jabbed, you can go out and live your life. Whereas if you can't, you're stuck yeah. indoors, then more people are going to get jabbed, I think. Yeah, so That usually focuses the mind, for sure. Yeah. Mike, uh, talk to me about the UK. What do you do with UK assets right now? I mean, the UK obviously is a market that's held up pretty well because it's got such a lot of energy and mining stocks in it. So that large cut bit has done fine. I do worry a bit about the outlook for the domestic UK economy. Um, you know, the measures we've seen from the Chancellor, I think, are very generous for the lowest part of the income distribution. And so that should help. But the middle part of the income distribution is still going to feel a very significant squeeze. You know, £400 towards something like a £1,500 increase in energy bills. Okay. The key question is, is that enough? Yeah. And, and, of course, this will all play out in currency swings with, you know, pound under pressure, but you also have the dollar rally. So how do you play currencies in this kind of volatile environment? Frankly, I wouldn't take big bets on currencies. I mean, sterling's down a long way already. But, I mean, if you see a scenario where that squeeze on the middle income in the UK does lead to a cutback in spending and potentially a recession and the US avoids that, well, then there could be further downside on sterling. Mike, thanks so much for all of the insight. Mike Bell, their global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management, joining us this morning. Now, coming up, plenty more on the markets. We'll also check in on some of your top stock movers, including Unilever, gaining after naming a, a new non-executive director. This is Bloomberg.
economics, politics, finance. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition of Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, this is what the markets are telling us. So quite a lot of pressure on European stocks. Look, I wouldn't say quite a lot of pressure, but certainly the pressure, the kind of pressure that we thought we wouldn't have today because we did see futures on the higher start. Then they were losing some half a percent, and now they're down one-tenth of a percent. Now, the underlying reason for this is that we're seeing stocks slipping or fluctuating at least because of the price of oil. Now, that's adding to worries about how aggressive central banks will need to be to rein in inflation without derailing growth. Now, some of the stocks on the move, quite a lot of M&A out there. DSM actually forming a fragrance giant via the purchase of Swiss Firmatech. Now, the resulting company will have an annual revenue of more than 11 billion euros. Again, this is a strategy shift from DSM, and it's nearly complete as it sheds its engineering arm and actually takes control of a company that has been owned by the same family for more than a century. You can see the, sh the share price getting 7.5 percent. Then Unilever, Nelson Peltz, the activist investor, has been named a non-executive director in Unilever. That share price also on the up. Credit Suisse down 3.3 percent after its weighing options to strengthen capital. That's a Reuters exclusive. Coming up, the miracle greenfield that may actually make climate change worse. We talk hydrogen. That's coming up next. And this is Bloomberg. Here are your top stories today. Embargo breakthrough. EU leaders agree to ban most Russian oil, paving the way for fresh sanctions on Putin. Brent jumps for the ninth straight day. Signs of daylight. China's economic contraction eases, signaling the worst of the lockdowns may be passed. Mainland stocks climb. Plus, half-point hikes. The Fed governor, Chris Waller, says he favors consecutive 50 basis point rate increases until inflation comes down. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, we're just getting some breaking news out of DWS. Uh, Deutsche Bank's DWS unit, we understand, has been raided, and this is amid allegations of greenwashing. The company, DWS, has been facing the allegations since its former chief sustainability officer, Desiree Fixler, went public with them in August, and that's been prompting regulatory probes in the U.S. and Germany, and we understand that this morning there were fresh, of course, uh, some of the units have been raided amidst these allegations of greenwashing. We'll be talking on this with our Nick Comfort in about 10 minutes from now. But still, sticking with green and greenwashing, it's been hailed as a miracle fuel that can power factories, buildings, ships, and even planes without pumping carbon dioxide into the air. But scientists are now warning that hydrogen carries many risks, including contributing to climate change. Well, that's the subject of today's Bloomberg's Big Take. And to tell us more about this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Akshat Rati. So, Akshat, just talk us through the concern with hydrogen. It's not that it's bad, but if there are leaks, it could be almost as bad as carbon dioxide. Is that right? That's right. So, the climate problem is a problem that's caused by greenhouse gases. These are essentially gases like carbon dioxide and methane that sit in the atmosphere and they capture this heat from the sun and then they don't let it escape. That's what's causing climate change. Now, hydrogen in itself is not a greenhouse gas, but when it leaks and it enters the atmosphere, what it does is it extends the life of other greenhouse gases like uh, methane, and that can extend the amount of warming that methane does to the planet. So the story here is that it's a warning before we invest tens of billions of dollars into hydrogen infrastructure as a way to try and tackle climate change, we should make sure that the hydrogen does not leak. So, Akshat, is there just a, an, an overarching worry that a lot of the technologies that we use and that have been touted for the green transition, we just don't know the end effect of yet? Is it a bigger warning for, for some of the things that we will transition to? 
Uh, not so much. I mean, we've had uh, struggles with recycling solar panels and wind turbines, for example, and even batteries. But what we do know is that their life cycle emissions, which is the total amount of emissions they would release in manufacturing uh, versus the amount of emissions they save in the 20, 25 year life they have, is far more. And so the, the amount of recycling effort needs to be low. Hydrogen is a different kind of beast because it's a fuel and we're going to use that fuel in large amounts. Um, and we know from from our previous experience that methane uh, leaks haven't been stopped. And so we should make sure that if we start using hydrogen instead, let us stop the leaks. Um, actually, is it expensive to stop the leaks or is it something that as long as we're aware of it, we can deal with it quite efficiently? It will be a small minor cost if we think about it before we build the infrastructure. It will be a higher cost if we try and fix the leaks after we build the infrastructure, hence the warning. Akshat, thanks so much. Akshat Rati there, of course, with the great Bloomberg quick take. Now, onto the markets because there is quite a lot going on in the markets. So we're seeing a bit of volatility across the board. Uh, stocks or certainly futures were higher than stocks were lower, and now they're creeping back up again. So we're seeing a bit of fluctuation across the board. The one thing we need to watch out for is, of course, the price of oil. The other one is uh, Treasury and Treasury yields, what they've been doing. Uh, the picture overall for EU inflation is not as bad today as we had yesterday. Yesterday, we had an incredible print, 8.7 percent higher for German inflation. Today, we had French inflation, and that came in pretty much in line with expectations at around 5.8 percent. Now, the other story we're watching out for is, of course, greenwashing, but also this probe into Deutsche Bank, the DWS unit of Deutsche Bank uh, being raided this morning amid allegations of greenwashing. So, I don't know if we have the market check, but overall, just fluctuation across the board. Let's now get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Good morning, Francine. Russia is planning a bond payment net mechanism to sidestep U.S. sanctions and a potential default. The proposal would allow foreign investors to open accounts in Russian banks in both rubles and hard currency. Russia is back in a default countdown after coupon payments in euros and dollars failed to reach foreign investors' accounts on Friday evening, effectively triggering a 30-day grace period. Now, business confidence in the U.K. rose for the first time in three months in May, the Lloyds Bank business barometer rose of five points to 38 percent, the highest reading since February. The findings suggest more companies plan to increase prices. A strong economic recovery could strengthen the Bank of England's conviction to aggressively tackle inflation. China's factory activity continued to shrink in May, but at a slower pace, as many of the tightest COVID restrictions began lifting gradually in some areas. The official manufacturing PMI rose to 49.6 from 47.4 in April. That compares with the medium estimate of 49 in a Bloomberg survey of economists. The non-manufacturing gauge increased to 47.8 from April's 41.9. President Joe Biden says there are limits to what he can do about guns. Over the weekend, the president visited the Texas elementary school when 19 children and two teachers were killed. Biden has renewed calls for Congress to crack down on the kinds of assault weapons that were used to carry out those killings. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. As always, Leanne Gerens in London with me. Now, coming up, DWS raided in Germany amid allegations of greenwashing. We'll get more on the story with our Nick Comfort in Frankfurt. This is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, DWS offices have been raided in Frankfurt. That's as the asset manager faces allegations 
of greenwashing. Well, joining us now is our banking and regulation editor, Nick Comfort, in Frankfurt. Nick, this is a Bloomberg story because we've been following it right from the very beginning. This is basically allegations since its former chief sustainability officer uh, blew the whistle in August. How much worse are things looking now? So this is, we're not, we don't have the full picture yet of sort of what exactly prosecutors are probing or the federal police. What we do know at this stage is that multiple police officers or authorities have entered the DWS buildings and the Deutsche Bank buildings here in Frankfurt. Uh, a security guard we spoke to on the ground said that these were federal police. Um, our understanding beyond that is also that this relates to greenwashing, but exactly what they are probing and whom they are probing within the, the companies, we're, we're still working on that part. Um, Nick, I, we know that DWS has actually denied the claims, but of course the, the raids just add to a list of regulatory and, and legal issues for Deutsche Bank. Is there a reputational damage as well? That's a good question, Francine, because um, I, I, when these claims first came out, I think there was a, a large assumption by, by many investors and analysts that maybe DWS would see their assets under management fall because of this. But actually, assets under management at DWS have held up pretty well over the last couple of quarters. So they've managed to really to shake off some of the, the concerns around probes by the SEC, by BaFin, into greenwashing. Uh, whether that this changes the picture will remain to be seen. Also, what it means for various executives at the company, whether this has an impact on them, uh, is also uh, a factor. But actually, so far, the bank has managed to, uh, well, the, and the asset manager has managed to deal with it quite well. Uh, Nick, we understand that law enforcement officials entered the Twin Towers. Can you give us any color on, you know, how, how big this operation was? So we saw two vans pulling up at the Deutsche Bank Twin Towers, and then we saw a total of uh, what we believe to be about half a dozen uh, cars uh, with, with Wiesbaden plates. Wiesbaden is the, the head of Hesse, the state where I'm based, and that's generally where law enforcement come from. We saw them pulling into the, uh, the, the DWS uh, parking garage just now, uh, and uh, more photos on that to follow. But so we believe it's, it's a... It's a an important, a significant operation, but however, compared to the raids that Deutsche Bank has experienced in the past, it's much more low key. We, there were no armed guards, there were no police cars with uh, with flashing lights on top. So this is something. I mean, reputationally, it's not good, but again, it's not a a, a full confrontation with the uh, the German justice system either. Nick, thank you so much. Uh, Nick Comfort there from Frankfurt. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Garrens. Hi, Leanne. Good morning, Francine. Shares of Unilever jumped today. Activist investor Nelson Paltz has been appointed as a director and his tree and fund management has taken a 1.5% stake in the company. The appointment comes after a difficult period for Unilever. CEO Ian Jope failed in an attempt to take over the consumer division of GlaxoSmithKline and has had to grapple with steep inflation in costs. PIMCO has emerged as a key player in a a panel meeting on Tuesday that will decide whether a Russian credit default swaps will pay out. SEC filings show PIMCO's income fund sold more than $100 million of the securities to banks, including Barclays and JP Morgan, in the first quarter. That added to almost a billion dollars in bets on Russia via credit default swaps. U.S. investor Todd Bowley has completed his $5.4 billion takeover of Chelsea Football Club. It ends almost 20 years of ownership under Russian billionaire Roman Abramovich, who was forced to sell under sanctions imposed over the war in Ukraine. The deal means that for the very first time, more than half of the teams in the English Premier League are now actually backed by American money. Canadian media giant Rogers and Shaw Communications have decided not to close a 20 billion Canadian dollar deal until anti trust problems are dealt with. The company said they're working to negotiate a solution to concerns by Canada's Competition Bureau, which is trying to actually block the takeover. Toronto-based Rogers has been trying to acquire Shaw in what would be one of the largest mergers in Canadian history. Taiwan-based iPhone maker Hon Hai expects supply chain disruptions
disruption to gradually clear up as Shanghai slowly opens to trade following months of COVID lockdowns. Hon Hai, Chairman Yang Lu, told shareholders the company is now more upbeat about its 2022 sales outlook than before. Hon Hai is Apple's biggest assembly partner. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Leanne Karen's in London with me now. We've also had plenty of corporate action this morning, a lot of deals. So let's check in on those deals with Bloomberg's Farid Salul. Uh, Farid, thank you for joining us. DSM, no longer an engineering company, now a fragrance boss. Morning, friends, Steve. Yeah, it looks that way. Look, so we've essentially got two deals in one here with DSM. Uh, firstly, they've uh, they bought the Swiss fragrance maker um, uh, Ferminec. Uh, that's going to create one of the largest companies in this uh, kind of sector for perfume yeah. scents and food flavors. Um, and that very much kind of ties in with DSM's pivot towards those kind of yeah. business lines. At the same time, it's sold its um, um, materials business, yeah. its thermoplastics business to Advent and Langsess. That gives it about three billion to play with presumably for this deal. For uh, GSK, big company here in the UK, yep. and they want to bolster their vaccine pipeline. They do indeed, and to do that, they're spending about $3.3 billion on a US vaccine maker uh, called uh, Finivax. Um, Emma Wormsley, as you say, she's under pressure to kind of uh, build up this pipeline of, of, of novel novel drugs in later stage development, mm -hmm. uh, and they've uh, they've got pressure from activist shareholders, Elliot, pushing them to do that, and a few other bits and pieces. Yeah, I feel like activist shareholders are everywhere. Um, yeah. very, if you look at Telecom Italian, this is a big one with the $21 billion deal? That's the one, yes. Yeah. So we've reported, it's a big one today, we've reported overnight that that's the valuation they're seeking for this um, uh, the, the, this network that they're selling to, uh, network assets that they're selling to Italy's state back lender CDP. Um, a big, big, big chunk of money that they can use to pay down debt and uh, finance uh, and finance their fibre rollout. Yeah, I, f I feel like we quizzed the Telecom Italia chief executive. It was so uncomfortable for the last couple yeah, of months. Like, yes. what are you doing with yeah, it? So finally, a... we have the news. Absolutely, yeah. Furry, thank you so much. Right. Furry Salul there with today's deals to watch. Now, coming up, EU leaders agreed to pursue a partial ban on Russian oil. Mm -hmm. We'll discuss their meeting today in Eurozone inflation next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition of Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, European Union leaders have come together to back a ban on Russian oil that covers more than two-thirds of imports. Earlier this morning, Latvia's Prime Minister told us what was next for the bloc. It should be a full energy embargo, oil, uh, coal and gas. Uh, we, before the war, were about 90% uh, Russian gas dependent. We are no longer buying any gas from Russia. I also don't see... Uh, the point of talking with someone who's committing genocide in a neighboring country. Now, this comes a day after Germany and Spain both reported jumps in consumer prices. Inflation in Germany is actually now at the highest level since reunification back in 1990. Now, full inflation figures for the Eurozone will be released in a few minutes at 10 a.m. UK time. We had French pretty much in line with expectations earlier on. Now, for more on this, looking at the politics and the inflation side of things, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo is in Brussels for us, and Xenia Goluchko is in London. So thank you both for joining us. First of all, Maria, pretty significant agreement. And I was extremely touched listening to the Latvian Prime Minister also saying, look, it's really up to the Ukrainians to say when this ends. Yeah, and Francine, those are the two fundamental questions here. One is, what do you do with sanctions? And, of course, the mood music here from multiple European leaders is that yesterday, when you look at the fine print, yes, we talked a lot about Viktor Orban, and yes, we talked a lot about Hungary, but if you look at the full picture and you see the seaborne embargo and that pledge from Germany to really cut down pipeline imports, you could be in a situation where, best-case scenario, there will be a reduction of purchase of Russian oil into the European Union by 19 to percent at the end of the year compared to pre-war levels. Also, you played it in that uh, interview that we did with the Latvian prime minister where he says we're not done with oil. The way we see it, we should now tackle gas. And this is going to be the next frontier. Although I should say, Francine, the more you move into gas, the more these sanctions bite. 
home and they bite mm -hmm. on the national market, the more difficult it becomes to have the debate. And then the other big issue here is we talk about Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, helping the Ukrainians to win. That is what the European leaders repeated yesterday. But when I asked them what does it mean, to me it is not clear what the meaning of it would be, what it entails, and ultimately what the end goal with this war uh, is. So there really needs to be uh, some kind of soul searching here from European leaders to really figure out what is the end goal from a European perspective and what does that victory mean and how can they further help uh, Ukrainians. By the way, the Ukrainian president repeated that yep. yesterday. We need your help in order to continue to fight in a week where the war in Donbass we know has become very difficult for the Ukrainians. Yeah, of course, victory means very different things for Ukrainian officials, which is getting every single Russian soldier out. And actually some of, you know, leaders in the West who say, well, maybe it's some kind of ceasefire or agreement. Xenia, when you look at the oil embargo, how are the markets t taking this? Yes, yeah, so while this is a major political uh, victory for uh, the European Union and its fight against the Russian aggression, for markets it's much more discouraging actually because it means that inflation is likely to continue going up. So we see oil surging on the news, right? And oil has staged an enormous rally this year on the supply constraints and risks around the war in Ukraine. So energy stocks, for example, in Europe are outperforming all other sectors while most sectors are in the red, energy is green, and it is the best performing sector overall this year. So for investors who are go getting into those oil majors, they've been doing really well, unlike the rest of the market, of course. Yeah, and Maria, when you look at what else is dominating the discussions, it's food inflation. We talk about famine in Northern Africa, but I don't know what leaders convened there in Brussels, where you are, have the power to do. Yeah, and, and Francine, actually, we're just hearing from, from a diplomat who's now in, in the talks uh, that are actively happening here, saying that there is a, or there will be an active discussion on, on the food situation. Remember the Ukrainians, Francine, they say that Russia has sequestered, essentially stolen uh, more than 22 billion, million tons, excuse me, of grain, and that these are blocked. And Ukrainian ports are now under Russian occupation, but also the logistics severely damaged as a result of the war. Now, yesterday, uh, Zelensky he jumped in this call with European leaders. He gave a speech for about seven minutes and he said, I really do need the help to be able to unblock some of these ports if we're really serious about tackling uh, this food crisis, which for a lot of European leaders, I should say, Francine, is a huge concern. You know, they worry about the domestic implications, the economic impact, food inflation, perennial conversation, but also the social unrest and the potential consequences. It has on issues like migration on Europe. Yeah, and of course, people taking to the streets. I mean, you could have, you know, the emergence of either far right or far left, Xenia. And this is one of the things that we were really hearing in Davos in all of the panel discussions. Uh, inflation figures coming out of the Eurozone a little bit later today, actually, in just a couple of minutes. What can we expect? Well, we've already seen very concerning figures from Spain, Germany, and France today. So I think the expectation is that uh, euro area inflation will surge. The issue is that it's putting a lot of pressure both on risk assets but also on central bank. So the ECB is meeting next week. It is supposed to set the stage for that July rate hike. It will be the first rate hike from the ECB in over a decade. And the question now is, how rapidly are they going to keep hiking? Are they going to follow the Fed in more rapid uh, 50 basis uh, hikes? Or are they going to go for milder 25 basis point ones? Yeah, I mean, again, this inflation, I mean, it has implica huge implications for, for right about everything. But yeah, concretely, is there anything that leaders can do? I mean, we talk about, for example, the price cap for energy prices. You can't do that with inflation because it's not food inflation. It's also there's just such a shortage that just cannot be filled. Yeah, and it's supply issues. And what they say is a lot of this is important inflation as a result of the war in Ukraine, which is very hard uh, to forecast and manage precisely, for instance, going back to the point we mentioned earlier, because we don't know what that end goal looks like. Nobody knows when the war will end, whether we're going into a long protracted conflict or actually there's a faster way out of this. And then the other issue, of course, is that you see that the technicalities of these deals are actually very, very hard to manage. You know, when we talk about a price cap, when we talk about a tariff, the real life implications of this as we're seeing with this package you know they're very difficult to manage actually these are very technical issues far beyond the politics thank you both for joining us Maria today there and Xenia Galuchko here in the studio now this is the picture for markets are fluctuating they were up they were down and now they're just borderline in the green now, Bloomberg surveillance early edition continues in the next hour Matt Miller Kaylee Lines in New York our guy Johnson is actually here in London and this is Bloomberg
we are sort of in uncharted territory. Like we've sort of never been here before. What the market has told us over the last three months, really, is they think the Fed has got this. It's not like they're going to jump suddenly from being hawkish to dovish. I think the time has passed for a soft landing. The market has been so focused on the Fed story, it's missed the European story. Everybody's facing an inflation problem right now. The consumer is really the most important data point here. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Keely Lines. 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Tuesday, May the 31st. Our top stories today. President Biden, Secretary Yellen, Chair Powell, meet today in the Oval Office at 1.15 Eastern. Top of the agenda, you guessed it, inflation, inflation, inflation. Talking of which, French consumer prices surge to a fresh record high. Eurozone CPI is breaking right now. 8.1 is the number. Will the ECB be forced to go 50 in July? And crude continues to climb as the EU agrees a partial ban on Russian oil imports. We're live in Brussels with the latest on that story. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Guy Johnson in London, Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. Kayleigh, let's talk about Asia. The Chinese PMI data, really interesting. Yeah, it was still in contraction territory when it came to that manufacturing PMI figure for the month of May, but it shows a slower contraction than previously. So that may indicate that the worst of the economic ramifications of COVID zero and the lockdowns in Shanghai have already hit the Chinese economy. Speaking of, we know that those lockdowns already are starting to ease in that area. In particular, cases are dropping all of that bolstering uh, some optimism for Chinese assets. That's really what led the gains in Asia overnight. The CSI 300 up about 1.6 percent. The MSCI Asia Pacific index as a whole up by just about four tenths of one percent. But that, as I said, eases some concern around the Chinese growth story. And in the bond market, you really see the focus shifting from growth back toward inflation. And that is reflected in selling pressure really in global bonds across the world. Yields moving higher, yeah, including yeah, in Australia and New Zealand, up about 10 basis points on that 10 year yield in Australia overnight, up about seven basis points on the New Zealand yield, which sits at about 3.61 percent, Matt. All right, we are looking at S&P futures, Kaylee, that are bouncing back and forth between gains and losses. So it's not really clear if we're going to the session risk on or risk off. You can see the yield rising on 10-year bonds, investors selling the paper, and right now we're yielding 2.82%. But there's a real back and forth, a real push-pull in terms of uh, yields and whether bonds are a buy right now or not either. Uh, uh, check out New York crude right now up three and a third percent. This is probably the most interesting and the most important of the major assets that we're watching today because we're really concerned about inflation. We've had massive increases in uh, Germany and Spain recording an all-time high since um, they started reporting inflation in this way. So it's a huge problem for governments around the world, certainly in Europe, but also here in the U.S. Bitcoin, finally, uh, we're looking at uh, $31,600. So Bitcoin had a big lift yesterday, a big lift over the weekend. Remember, we were down at 28 thousand on Friday, but it's really been hovering around this $30,000 level for the last couple of weeks and, and not a lot of big movement um, away from there. I just think, Guy, this is significant in that it's been so correlated. This is a signal yep. that maybe markets are going to be risk on throughout the day. Big show coming up later as well, Matt. I know that you and Kelly are going to be talking about this a great deal on the crypto show a little bit later right here on Bloomberg. Let's recap that data we got at the top of the hour. I mentioned the 8.1 Eurozone headline number. That's versus an estimate of 7.8 and a previous number of 7.5. Italian May inflation rate rising to 7.3. The median estimate there, 6.7%. We know that we've got the QE story in June. The question is, do we get 25 or 50 from the ECB in July. That is the live debate right now. Is the ECB so far behind the curve it now needs to play massive catch up? Let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of the asset story today. Stock 600 down by two tenths of 1%. Remember, European markets were open yesterday. Uh, you've got Euro dollar trading still with a 107 handle, but it is dipping. The dollar's coming back today. Pay attention to that story. I'm really fascinated to hear what comes out of this meeting in the Oval Office. And Brent Crude, Matt, Matt was mentioning what is happening there. Pick up yesterday on the back of the Chinese news. And today we get another lift as a result of the European news on the, uh, the partial embargo uh, that we're going to see for Russian crude. I want to show you as well, it is the 31st. We've got a month-end phenomenon that we need to talk about as well. But this is the story over the last 31 days. Uh, we're trading 445 today. In terms of the round trip, 
it really isn't a very big one. Basically, we've dipped and come back. The stock 600 over the month, Kaylee, up by just three tenths of 1%, but it is a positive number. Yeah, it feels like there's been so much volatility only for us to end up essentially flat on the month guy. And I know I say this every month, but I can't believe tomorrow is already June or only June. I never can decide which one. Now let's take a look other than June starting at what is ahead this week. Today, President Biden will be holding a rare Oval Office meeting with Fed Chair Jerome Powell. We understand Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will also be in attendance. Plus, later on today, we will get the latest read on the U.S. consumer with consumer confidence data crossing the wire. We'll also be hearing from Fed speakers throughout the week, including uh, Loretta Mester and Lael Brainerd. And there's a virtual OPEC Plus meeting happening on Thursday. And finally, rounding out the week, U.S. Jobs Day is on Friday, Matt. All right, very important stuff then coming out this week. But it already kind of kicked off yesterday in Frankfurt in terms of the Fed. Governor Chris Wallace, uh, sorry, Waller, said he wants to keep raising rates in half percentage point steps until inflation is under control. This comes after the Fed raised rates by a half point this month and indicated it's going to do the same in June and July. Waller um, spoke on Memorial Day, as I said yesterday, out of Germany. I support tightening policy by another 50 basis points for several meetings. In particular, I am not taking 50 basis points, 50 basis point hikes off the table until I see inflation coming down closer to our 2% target. I had someone ask me last week if they celebrate Memorial Day in Germany, and the answer, without being rude, is simply no. Meanwhile, President Biden will hold a rare Oval Office meeting today with Fed Chair Jerome Powell to discuss the economy and rising inflation. I think Yellen's going to attend as well. But this is the first meeting um, between the president and the Fed chair since uh, Biden announced his intention to nominate Powell for a second term. Joe Matthew, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now in D.C. for more Joe, so how rare is this? Well, to your point, it's been since November. That's when they last sat down, Matt, in the Oval to talk about then uh, Powell's renomination. And to your point as well, Janet Yellen is going to be here. Uh, look, these Oval meetings are rare, but the Fed is very much in touch with the administration on a regular basis. Jay Powell has a weekly standing breakfast with Janet Yellen. And the Fed has a monthly lunch with members of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Important to remember, though, the White House likes to remind us, of course, Matt, as you know, that this is an independent Fed. And the president himself has said that he's never going to do what the last guy did, as he says, in the prior administration when Donald Trump used to enjoy kind of poking the Fed on Twitter and telling them it's time to cut or time to do whatever. In this case, the White House wants to give the impression here that the Fed is independent, and we, of course it is, uh, but this conversation will serve a couple of different, in a way, a couple of different things. So first, they, they're going to talk about what the president refers to as the biggest, most important issue on the campaign trail, and that is inflation. But it's about optics, right? You're going to have images of them in the Oval. They're going to let the press pool in for the beginning of this. It's not a news conference or a briefing. So you'll see images of the three of them on the couches. They'll likely have some questions shouted at them. And, Matt, this isn't going to be like a Bloomberg uh, type of exploration, whether it's 50 or 75 basis points, you're going to hear questions like, has inflation peaked? And the president, the administration hopes to generate mainstream news headlines out of this meeting today. All right, Joe. Well, President Biden continues to be focused on the economic picture. He also is fresh off a trip to Uvalde, Texas, where he visited that elementary school where 19 children and two students were killed in a mass shooting, or uh, yeah. and two teachers, I should say, were killed in a mass shooting last week. And the president saying, look, there is limited measures I myself can take on the gun control issue. He said a lot is up to Congress. What is the likelihood that Congress is realistically going to do anything? Well, he is right about that, for starters. You might remember the president signed an executive order to regulate ghost guns a few weeks back, but he doesn't have a lot of options here without Congress, and that's why we're watching very closely uh, to see uh, Democrat Chris Murphy in the Senate and Republican John Cornyn talk about any sort of way forward here on likely red flag laws that seems to be uh, the, the concept that Democrats and Republicans can get together on. But the window is short here. If there is going to be a move, they're going to have to do it now as soon as lawmakers come back. Kaylee, they've been meeting by phone and Zoom uh, over the holiday weekend. Those talks are expected to continue for the week. Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, though, says when lawmakers do come back to town, if there's no compromise, Democrats will move forward on a bill. The problem is they don't have the votes to change much. Joe, 
Thanks for the update. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew joining us out of DC. And of course, you can listen to Joe every weekday on his radio program, Sound On, 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Radio. Now, oil is heading for its longest run of monthly gains in more than a decade. This after, well, a bunch of factors come together. China's one of them. But now we've got EU leaders also agreeing to pursue a partial ban on imports of most Russian crude. Our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, spoke to Latvia's Prime Minister at the EU Council building earlier today. It should be a full energy embargo, oil, uh, coal and gas. Uh, we, before the war, were about 90% uh, Russian gas dependent. We are no longer buying any gas from Russia. I also don't see uh, the point of talking with someone who's committing genocide in a neighboring country. Maria joins us now from Brussels. Maria, there was a lowering of expectations yesterday that anything would be achieved at this summit. We have had something achieved. We have a partial ban. How significant is this? Well, I think it's actually more significant than you would think when you look at this uh, from uh, first sight. When you look at just the situation yesterday in the morning, everyone here was incredibly pessimistic about this deal happening. There was talk of a watered down of a watered down uh, package. And today what we have is a partial oil embargo. Like technically that is uh, correct. Initially it just looks at seaborne uh, oil. So that is a transportation of Russian oil exports into the European Union by sea. But that would put an end to two thirds of the purchases. The other big important thing is that, yes, there is an exemption to pipeline oil, but yesterday the Germans, which are the big buyers, they continue to say by this year they want to exit this position. So you could be in a situation where by the end of this year, the purchase, the amount of oil that comes from the Russian Federation into the European Union could decline by 90 percent. Now, for many officials, this is seen as a money maker. It's the oil, not the gas. The gas is a geopolitical weapon. So many today are actually more optimistic uh, about the prospects of this and say that when you take a bigger look at this, what was achieved yesterday was significant. The one thing I would note, however, is that I do hear repeatedly from a number of officials that say at this point, having done this, we need to take a breather. We need to take a pause and we don't want to talk about gas because this could be a real detrimental impact on the EU. However, some other countries in the Baltics say a full ban is needed. So you could see some political tension in terms of what come next. Yep, and that's going to feed through into the inflation numbers that we've been watching so carefully here today. Maria, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Maria today joining us from the Council Building in Brussels. Let's turn our attention now to what is happening in China. China's factories still struggled in May, but the data we got out overnight better than expected. The numbers suggest that the worst of the current economic fallout from lockdowns may be coming to an end as the country starts to reopen. Let's get more now from Ender Curran, our Chief Asia Economics Correspondent. Uh, a silver lining then maybe in this data. Yeah, some signs that perhaps the economy is now bottoming out. When you look at the data, uh, there was an improvement for new orders, improvement for new export orders, employment in manufacturing is picking up, delivery time for manufacturers is improving. So it all suggests the manufacturing sector is getting back on its feet, as is the services sector. Uh, but as you mentioned, Guy, it's still in contractionary territory. The economy, especially Shanghai, is slowly reopening. But a question that, that a lot of people are asking is, you know, how long can the reopening go before the aggressive COVID zero strategy forces another round of restrictions or even something more severe than that, maybe another lockdown? So it's a question of how sustainable this recovery is going to be. The authorities again today roll out yet more support measures. They're talking now about tax support for those buying low emission vehicles. But despite the headline a uh, positive take on today's data. A lot of people are saying China is nowhere near a V-shaped recovery. I have to bring up a story that, that sounds silly at first, but um, could have real implications. In the Top Gun sequel, Maverick is wearing a jacket with the Taiwan flag uh, on the back. Um, there was applause apparently in Taiwan when this was shown at the premiere, but this movie will not be shown in China. Does this highlight growing tensions between China and Taiwan, between the U.S. and China? Well, China-U.S. relations are obviously tense over Taiwan anyway, so this movie will certainly be an irritation in the mix of all of that. Like you mentioned, it's not expected to be shown in China, but what it could 
be signaling, Matt, is that perhaps now Hollywood is pushing back against Chinese censorship. They had been criticised for bowing to Chinese censorship in, in recent years. Uh, this flag hadn't been, uh, hadn't been seen in a trailer for the movie back around 2019, according to her own reporting, and it has made an appearance now, and that might be seen as something of a, a gesture of a, of a pushback. But, you know, in the broader scheme of things, it's unlikely to uh, necessarily change the US-China uh, relations over Taiwan. That's already tense enough as it is. We've seen the reaction over President, com President Biden's comments uh, last week, and I think that remains on the trajectory that it is. Ender, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed for updating us. Ender Curran, I've yet to see the movie. Our producer has seen it twice. I feel I'm definitely letting the side down. Uh, OK, let's turn our attention to a Bloomberg scoop. Deutsche Bank and its asset management firm DWS have had their Frankfurt offices raided this morning by police. This, of course, adding to legal headaches facing Germany's largest lender. Our banking and regulation reporter Nick Comfort joins us now from Frankfurt. So, Nick, again, unmarked police cars outside Deutsche Bank. Can you walk us through the details of what we know? So we've seen uh, unmarked police cars uh, moving into the, uh, the, the parking garage over at, at DWS and, uh, and also two police cars over at Deutsche Bank. Uh, more police cars over DWS and clearly they're in focus on this one. The Frankfurt prosecutors have sent a statement saying that they are, this relates to greenwashing. Um, now, what, what, there we have, we've had a, a long saga with a, a woman who calls herself a whistleblower, so a, a former DWS employee, their chief sustainability officer who had accused the company of greenwashing, uh, of, of not living up to, uh, to what uh, customers expected when they invested in ESG products. Um, now, what the prosecutors they're saying today is that this relates to uh, unnamed and unknown staff and managers at DWS. Um, we've got to see whether the they say they have indications that the, uh, DWS has not been living up to its, its standards here. Um, but deep, ESG is such a squishy topic, and I'm not sure they're yeah. really going to be able to... I mean, I'm interested to see what they can turn up. All right, Bloomberg's Nick Comfort in Frankfurt. Thank you so much. Now let's get back to the U.S. markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading. We're going to talk about Top Gun Maverick again. Guy hasn't seen it yet. I haven't seen it either. I have tickets for Friday, but a lot of people went to see it over the weekend. It grossed more than $100 million Friday through Sunday alone, and that is lifting shares of movie theater operator AMC Entertainment. It's up about 3.3% before the bell. Among other groups of stocks moving to the upside would be basically anything tied to cryptocurrencies after gains we saw for the likes of Bitcoin over the weekend, including Coinbase, the big crypto exchange. It's up about 4%. And of course, we also were just talking about the European oil story with Maria Tadeo. That is lifting oil and it's lifting in turn energy shares in early hours here in the U.S., including Occidental Petroleum, up about two and three quarters of a percent before the bell guy. In my defense, I did see the original one at the cinema. Fair there enough. There are a few people in this office that can say that. There are many <laughs> that can't. I did. OK, yeah, exactly. I think Matt and I may be in the same camp on this one. Uh, OK, so euro area inflation hitting a record high. How hard does the ECB need to go? Sebastian Galli, senior macro strategist in Nordea Asset Management, is going to be joining us next. We're going to talk about that oil story that Kaylee was mentioning as well. Martin Ratz, chief commodity strategist and head of European oil and gas research, and Morgan Stanley joining us a little later. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We are simulcast on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kaylee Lines. Guy Johnson is with us out of London, where they have a real inflation problem. I mean, we do here as well, but Europe is seeing record numbers. In fact, Spain has the highest uh, level of inflation since they started measuring it in a new harmonized European way. We've seen big inflation prints, more than expected in Germany, um, as well as um, overall in Europe. Joining us to talk about this is Ksenia Galuchko. She is Bloomberg, uh, uh, Bloomberg's equities team leader. And, you know, I felt like we should see more of a risk on sentiment today with China maybe ready to ease lockdowns and the month of May coming to an end. But this is still a huge problem, isn't it? 
It is a huge issue, that's right, uh, because there has been some expectation that inflation will finally peak and start slowing from here, but not yet, as we see from today's European numbers. Uh, inflation remains a huge concern. And this is a very important moment because the ECB does meet next week and they will have to send a strong message about the upcoming rate hikes that they're planning. So the July rate hike will be the first in over a decade from the ECB, and it'll be very significant because we'll have to see, will they go for 25 basis point hike, a more tame one, or will they be brave and go for 50 basis point one, considering how high inflation numbers are in Europe? So Brent's up 15%, the euro's up 1.9%, this is month to date. And the real surprise for me, and I had to double check the numbers, equities are actually higher on the month. <laughs> yes, that's the amazing thing. And even the S&P 500, which was flirting with the bear market just a week ago, might have a small bounce this month or, fl or flat uh, in May. I mean, it's really quite fascinating, but it just shows you that equities are always thinking ahead. So the sell-off that we've seen since the start of the year, and it's been a very, very big sell-off, I must say, mainly driven by growth and tech stocks. But generally, the markets have done poorly across the world, in Europe and the U.S. and emerging markets. You know, maybe it might be time for a bounce. So Citi's uh, flagship index, for example, of red flags, is now saying that it's time yep. to buy the dip. And there's other strategists are, that are saying that it's not just a bear market rally, but there might be opportunities now to pick it up from here. Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley, not quite so convinced, <laughs> but I don't think any of us are going to be surprised by that. Ksenia, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Ksenia Galuchko uh, joining us on what is happening in markets. For more market analysis, of course, you can check out our blog live on the terminal, MLIV Go on your Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. So what do you need to know? Let me tell you, President Biden, Secretary Yellen, Chair Powell, meeting today in the Oval Office. The time, 1.15 Eastern. Top of the agenda, yep, you guessed it. Inflation, inflation, inflation. Talking of which, Eurozone inflation accelerated to a fresh all-time high, posing further problems for the ECB. Will the central bank be forced to go 50 in July? And crude continues to climb as the EU agrees a partial ban on Russian oil imports. We're going to discuss that with Martin Ratz of Morgan Stanley in just a moment. I'm Guy Johnson in London. Matt Miller, Kayleigh Lyons over in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. Matt, let's talk about the setup. You guys have had a day off. What are we looking like this Tuesday? Yeah, I thought, you know, we had a day off. May's coming to an end. Um, China looks like it may be ready to loosen lockdowns, and that could drive demand. We see it playing through in oil, and I thought it would be uh, positive for U.S. futures. We were briefly at around 4.45 this morning uh, higher, but now we've come back down about a third of 1%, and um, investors are selling 10-year debt. That should be risk on as well, right? The yield floating up to 282. If they're willing to let go of that, that yeah. safety, yeah. Um, then they should be putting their money into um, something less uh, safe, more risky, I should say, like uh, stocks. That's not happening yet. NYMEX crude is rising 3.2%. This certainly on the uh, Chinese move. We've heard from um, people like Simon Kennedy and Javier Blas, um, that if China's lockdowns are loosened, you'll see demand rise instantly. Indeed, uh, they're allowing cars on the streets in some parts of Shanghai now. And right now, NYMEX crude is up to 118. This is not a Brent quote. This is uh, Texas Intermediate. Um, Bitcoin is also up 1%, but it had, a, I think, a 5% gain yesterday. So it's back up far above 30 at 31,583 and although it's not you know in turn in Bitcoin terms that's not a lot of volatility but it's starting to move higher and that should be a risk on indicator as well Kaylee what do you see in terms of the pre-market well of course it was really the gains for Bitcoin over the weekend that were notable when Bitcoin was trading but no other equities here in the US were trading of course for the long holiday weekend so you're seeing some of those crypto related stocks playing catch up to the weekend gains of Bitcoin in pre-market trading the likes of riot blockchain up about seven percent Percentage points and micro strategy, which is basically uh, a Bitcoin proxy stock because it holds a lot of it uh, on its balance sheet. It's up about 11 percent. And you're also seeing, along with the gains for oil that Matt was mentioning, you're seeing a lift for stocks really across the energy complex in early hours here in the U.S. That includes Occidental Petroleum and Marathon Oil, each up in the ballpark of about two and a half percent, Guy.
Let's talk about what's happening here in Europe. We've got inflation data to digest. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. Today, stocks are lower. I'll show you the monthly number in just a moment. Uh, but today, we're all the fours. Uh, we're down by four-tenths of 1%. We're keeping a keen eye on what is happening with the inflation narrative. What impact will that have on the European equity story going forward from here? Clearly, margins in focus. Euro dollar trading 107.31. We're hanging on to that 107. Is the ECB really prepared to go 50 in July, what kind of a message would that send? Brent crude, one, two, three, spot six, six. Matt was mentioning TI. We're up by 1.64%. Yesterday, it was news out of China in terms of the loosening that we're going to see in Shanghai and Beijing that drove oil prices up to around 120. Today, we get a second leg, that driven by the fact that we're seeing Europe delivering a partial ban, uh, a seaborne ban on Russian crude. The pipeline is going to continue uh, to supply crude to Central Europe. But nevertheless, just another factor uh, in messing around with this market and limiting supply. I mentioned the one month, month, one month, month uh, uh, chart one month chart yeah I got that right <laughs> eventually uh, one month we are trading up by two tenths of one percent it's getting awfully close Kaylee in terms of delivering a positive number for the month of May yeah, just a fractionally positive one, Guy. But, of course, the European markets right now are trying to grapple with the inflation story. 8.1%, the number out of Europe this morning. 39.1% CPI year-on-year -year is the number we are looking at out of Sri Lanka. That is a far greater number than the estimate, which was for 35% consumer price inflation in that country. And we know that it has led to some serious political instability in Sri Lanka in particular. So let's continue this inflation conversation. Joining us now is Sebastian Galli, senior macro strategist at Nordia Asset Management. So, Sebastian, let's focus on the European inflation story in particular, which Guy was just talking about. 8.1%. What does it mean for the ECB? What it means for the ECB is uh, that they're in trouble. But the problem is the, what type of inflation are you talking about? It's an inflation which has been surging on the back of supply chains as well as on the back of rising oil prices for multiplicity of reason under investments in oil prices, good demand before from China, probably recovering from China again. And the way you can control inflation is what is really domestic, a wage inflation spiral. But the other way you can control it is through the level of the exchange rate because that will, that will determine in, uh, imported inflation from commodities such as oil prices. And what it's flagging is a two rate hike at least up 25 basis points starting in in July. And of course, we're going to get uh, the new forecast. Um, but the reality so is it probably should 50, do more. Sebastian? No, I think it should do 50 basis points and a series of 50 basis points to raise the level of the euro probably to 120 to 130 level. But, but it won't do it because it's really hoping that it's, it can gain a battle of time. Over time, it will win um, because energy prices probably won't rise dramatically from where, where they are right now. But it's a, a very dangerous game to play because over time, people get more and more frustrated. We saw that in the French elections. We're going to see that maybe in the legislative elections and other elections around Europe. And also has an impact on behavior. People vehicles start to get annoyed. It's really expensive. It, I can dip in my savings of a month or two months. But over time, you get really annoyed. And that creates political frustrations, pressure on the on the labor market, and creates right. very bad dynamics. Yeah. And it's just hoping Annoyed for the or hungry, right? Um, <laughs> Sebastian, at, at what point... I mean, have we have we peaked in inflation right now? You said the energy um, pressures maybe aren't there anymore because Europe is kind of talking about uh, an oil embargo, but they're obviously not going to stop sending money to Moscow for gas. So is that off the table and, and maybe inflation, this is as high as it gets? Well, the, the energy part is, is, is interesting because as uh, China reopens, it does create more demand. And so oil prices we saw today and probably going to continue to see for the next two weeks are still rising. Uh, but there's also a feedback loop from the fact that you have very elevated level uh, of oil prices on demand consumptions all around the world. So we're probably getting closer to high le levels of energy. The question is really on the supply chain, and it's probably improving over the next few weeks. But we have shocks still percolating from Shanghai, a little bit Beijing, uh, and possibly other parts uh, of China. And we see some snarling also on the on the east coast on the west coast in uh, in the u.s so it's not yet over um there's just too much demand too much liquidity and what we call the supply uh curve is simply too inelastic it's reacting a lot to very little prices shoot up but they also shoot down also very is fast there, so is there an asset sebastian i mean if you had a dozen eggs that you had to put in one basket is there an asset that you like right now 
Yeah, probably what you're focusing on is a like of LEQ Coca-Cola. You want to have companies which have a solid earnings are not, if you look at their maturity cycle, they're not at the end. They're not going for obsolescence. They're, they're doing quite well. Coca-Cola is another one. So you focus on quality and value, and that will drive you through for the next few uh, quarters when the environment is more complex yep. than it has been for over the past few decades. Sebastian, how high does euro dollar need to be for it to have a meaningful impact in terms of reducing the energy impact on Europe's economy? And what is it going to take to get the bunt to 1.5? One, to, to 1 We're at 1.07 right now. Do you see 1.5? Well, if you think uh, you're invested in the market and you have a world which is so uncertain, and what are you going to do in this world when you're concern, you don't know if you should invest in equity or not, you hold a, a position which we call high quality liquid assets and you put a lot in the dollar and you put a lot in boons, also Swiss franc, Japanese yen, a little bit. Um, and, and so you hold that position. That means the boon curve is artificially uh, maintained low. But as the ECB is forced to act, that curve also will start to steepen and move in parallel shift uh, forward. So it's, it's probably something to look forward to. OK, back to the question of, of the euro. If, if the ECB probably... wanted to use the euro as a tool to, to reduce the energy impact, how high would it have to be? I mean, you just have to look at the size of oil price movement that we've seen. So euro needs to move a lot. And 120 to 130 just brings euro back to, towards reasonable levels, towards the average. What has the ECB tried to do over the past uh, few many years is try to weaken the euro versus everybody, particularly uh, relative to, to the dollar through negative interest rates, the same way as other central banks have done before them. Sweden, for example, Denmark, Swiss are attached to the eurozone like big satellites with, uh, with a big core in the, in the middle. Uh, and it's just not a very nice strategy to do when you're fighting uh, w with uh, NATO against yep. uh, against Russia in a proxy war. So you need to move away from negative interest rates. But then the big question is, how high do you want to push your dollar? And it's actually quite a lot, which is, of course, something a lot of exporters from Germany to France to many others will not like. So there's going to be a lot of pushback from different governments not to raise by 50 basis points. And so the prudent thing is to do 25 basis points in a regular uh, fashion. Usual okay. rate, of course, is very uncertain. 130 feels like a long way away. Um, they've pushed yeah, it down. Yeah. They've pushed it up. We'll see how high they can get it. Sebastian Galli, thank you very much indeed. Sebastian Galli, senior macro strategist, joining us from Nadia Asset Management. Coming up, we'll focus back on that energy story, but from a different angle. Martin Ratz, chief commodity strategist and head of European oil and gas research, joining us from Morgan Stanley. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Governor Asa Hutchinson, Republican from Arkansas. That's at 12.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. So this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Guy Johnson in London. Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines are both back in New York after Memorial Day. Let's talk about what is happening with crude. We came at it from the foreign exchange angle just a moment ago with Sebastian Galley. Oil heading for its longest run of monthly gains in more than a decade. Uh, the latest push higher comes as EU leaders agree to pursue a partial ban on Russian uh, oil imports. Joining us now, Martin Ratz, Chief Commodity Strategist and Head of European Oil and Gas Research at Morgan Stanley. Martin, so we have a partial ban. Seaborne oil is going to be sanctioned, uh, but we're going to see pipeline oil continuing. What impact is this going to have? Um, yeah, the impact is quite meaningful. Um, so there's a lot of focus, of course, uh, on crude, uh, and that's understandable. That's the bulk of Russian exports. Um, cr but crude can ultimately be diverted away from uh, Europe. It can go to uh, Asian countries, for example, and we're already seeing some of that. Uh, now, even that will have limitations to it. I would suspect that even for crude, Russia will find it difficult over time uh, to find enough buyers. Uh, but the real sting, I would say, in this, uh, in, in this EU plan uh, is diesel. Uh, the diesel market is extremely tight pretty much everywhere globally. Uh, Russia exports via the seaborne market about a million barrels a day of diesel. Um, that is all seaborne, nothing through pipeline, and it pretty much all goes into Europe. And that is, that is very hard to divert to other regions. So what this plan will pr uh, probably mean uh, is that that million barrel a day of flow from Russia into Europe of diesel will dry up. 
Uh, that will back yep. up through the Russian refining system. Europe will still need to get its diesel somewhere else. It makes for a very tight diesel market. Diesel prices go up and that lifts crude with it. Seaborne, seaborne oil, seaborne diesel can be sent elsewhere. Are we going to see that happening? What kind of a discount will that crude and diesel therefore uh, have to tolerate out in Asia? I'm hearing pretty significant discounts are being applied at the moment. And what does that mean that it then displaces other diesel that can come from elsewhere around the world? Is this just a shuffling of the deck chairs here, Martin, is really the question I'm asking. Yeah, in crude, that can sort of partially happen. So uh, Russian exports uh, of crude via the seaborne market are in the order of four and a half million barrels a day to make their way into Europe. The, two and a, the other two and a half go somewhere else. And that has already shifted a bit. There are, uh, European imports are about down half a million barrels a day via the seaborne market. Asian imports are up about a half a million barrels a day. So to an extent, that is already happening a bit. But it's worth noting that Russian ports do not take these very large crude carriers, VLCCs, the biggest oil tankers that can ship, you know, one and a half to two million barrels in one cargo. Russian ports don't take these uh, those type of vessels. They only take smaller Aframax vessels that can ship, say, 600 to 800,000 uh, barrel cargoes. So if you want to fully um, sort of, you know, revamp the trade patterns around the world, so to say, you need an awful lot of Aframaxes. Uh, and we're already mm. seeing Aframax rates recently relatively high that market is already tight. For diesel, I don't think that you can re reroute these trade patterns uh, all that easily. That's, that's very difficult. It's, I mean, I have a lump in my throat when I think about the diesel issue, uh, Martin. I want to get to a viewer question, um, uh, a viewer writing in asking about the possibility of, you know, if, um, and it is a big if, there's a resolution to Russia's war in Ukraine next month, uh, how fast would oil and gas prices um, converge back to pre-conflict levels? Um, well, that answer is perhaps a little bit more benign for natural gas prices. Um, I would say that um, about a third or so of the uh, TTF price at the moment, you can trace back to a geopolitical risk premium. In the European natural gas market, the fundamentals are not such that you would suggest uh, prices at these levels. Uh, you would need to explain the premium simply by a geopolitical risk premium, the risk that Russian natural gas into Europe would simply be a cutoff. But in oil, that is not the case. Um, uh, oil is, um, is much more of a global story. Uh, it doesn't fully rely uh, on uh, the issue around uh, Russian supplies. Sure, if the whole th uh, issue were to de-escalate, oil could soften a bit. And given the rally that we recently had, that can be quite meaningful. It can be five bucks, it can be $10 a barrel. Um, uh, but oil has fundamental underpinnings uh, that I would say um, right. are, are more are strong enough to underpin quite high prices. Right. Supply was already tight going into the conflict in Ukraine, Martin. Given that, given that there is fundamental reasons why oil prices are so elevated, what is your assessment about what that means for production and whether big oil majors, for example, are going to be ramping up capacity? Uh, the oil majors will not be ramping up capacity. I think this is one of the um, uh, most unusual phenomena of this of this upcycle. If this was any other upcycle, we would now see capex budgets in upstream oil and gas going higher. We would see upwards guidance uh, in terms of uh, production growth, uh, and we're not seeing that at all amongst the majors. Um, uh, it, these companies have had their messages from their shareholders loud and clear. They are transitioning. They are maintaining production, sort of for the time being, with limited capex budgets, but they're focused increasingly. Uh, on other things uh, these days. So, you know, th that creates tension in the oil market that needs to be resolved. And the way that's currently being resolved is via price. Martin, thanks so much for joining us. Great to get your voice today. Hope to get you back on again soon. Martin Ratz there, Chief Commodity Strategist and Head of European Oil and Gas Research over at Morgan Stanley. Now, some people consider them commodities, others currencies. Some people think they're just digital Ponzi schemes. But we think cryptocurrencies are interesting no matter uh, what you make of the long-term um, implications. Don't forget to watch Bloomberg Crypto today at 1 p.m. New York time. It's our weekly show. It covers the people, transactions, and the technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines in New York. Guy Johnson is in London. Um, and Tom Keene is, I believe he's back. Let, let me, yes, it looks like he's back in his surveillance OG studio. Tom, I know you've been on an epic trip to uh, Switzerland and to London. Did you skip Europe completely? No, you know, we, we did the rounds. We did Davos, very, very busy. Spent a wonderful 12 hours, 18 hours in London and back home. And as you know, uh, Matt, the inflation story today really paints a picture. And part of that inflation is oil. So let's look at uh, a chart that goes way, way back. This is Saudi light back to World War II uh, with the Nixon deflation in oil. Then up we go with OPEC. And the headline here, Matt, is that where we are on inflation-adjusted oil priced in 2022 dollars, is higher than we were at the peak in OPEC. We were higher in 2010, but on an inflation-adjusted basis, we've now exceeded the early 1980s. It's going to be fascinating to see the impact that that ultimately has, Tom, on the uh, the equity market going forward. We've seen that kind of rotation towards energy stocks. You've got Oppenheimer on a little bit later. Peter's going to be joining you from Goldman Sachs. Well, it'll be about the sectors and, and really dovetailing in what energy will do and how the rest of the economies will react. I, Guy, the, the, the inflation numbers in your Europe were just stunning. I mean, way, way off the grid. All right. Yes, they were. 8.1%. Pretty remarkable. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Looking forward to your conversations about that and much more over the next three hours. Thank you so much. Now, what else are we watching today? I will be watching the White House at 1.15 p.m. Eastern time when President Biden is going to be meeting with none other than Fed Chairman Jerome Powell as well as Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. And guys, the White House official agenda for today says they're going to be discussing the state of the American and global economy and the president's top economic priorities priority addressing inflation. My question is, if the Fed acts to rein in inflation, if they continue with 50 basis point rate hikes, in theory, that is going to mean in unemployment could move higher. The economy could slow down, perhaps even ultimately a recession within the next, say, 18 months here in the U.S. Is that really what President Biden is willing to face in order to get inflation down? Because as we know, this is going to be probably issue number one heading into the midterm elections, which are getting closer and closer coming up in November, Matt. And that's a big political problem for this U.S. president. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they make the decision, you know what, we've already lost the midterm elections. Let's go ahead and eat a recession now to put ourselves in a better position for 2024. Maybe that's ridiculous. I'm going to ask Joe Matthew or someone else more informed than myself. I will be watching uh, housing data today because we're going to get a slew of it out. Um, FHFA home price index coming out at 9 o'clock. We're also going to get the S&P CoreLogic. Um, that's the Case-Shiller data coming out. So it's um, 20 different regions across the U.S. And we've seen, you know, outside of the U.S., in Canada, um, in London, in other places, the housing market that has been so red hot, I guess all of England or even the entire U.K. guy um, has seen this, <laughs> kind of turn around. And I'm hoping to see or I'm looking to see if that's going to be the case in the U.S. as well. We should all point out here that Matt just bought a house. So <laughs> buying at the peak could be something that hurts top. a little bit. Yeah. Be absolutely. If you want to feel better about yourself, though, Matt, I'm suggesting maybe going and seeing Top Gun Maverick. Could be I a, would like could be to. a way to kind of lift your spot. I haven't seen it yet. You haven't seen it yet. And he's got I. tickets, which I think are quite hard to come by. So, yeah, I think that'll, that'll be exciting. I wonder if the president's seen it. He always loves those aviator sunglasses. I hear those are back as well. <laughs> I wonder what car. I just, I mean, obviously the planes uh, are the focus, but I just I knew saw. I you go to the car. I just saw what looked like a Ford Bronco. I wonder what car he drives in that film. Uh, I would, I'm surprised you're not going for the bike. I think the bike's the same one as last time. Anyway, that wraps Helmet. things up. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have already seen, uh, seen the movie. I know our producer's seen it twice. That's it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>